Hello guys, how are you? I'm Hadeep Singh. Welcome back to your own YouTube channel. IELTS updates and recent exams. For more updates related to recent IELTS exam writing test topics, listening, reading, practice test, and speaking, you can just work. Please guys, participate in everyday listening and reading practice test to achieve your desired band score in your actual IELTS exam. Please hit the like and subscribe button. Press the bell icon for the upcoming notifications. Don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page IELTS updates and recent exams. Part 1. You will hear a woman talking to a man about joining a drama club. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hello, Robert Gladwell speaking. Oh, hi. My name's Chloe Martin. I was given your name and phone number by Ben Winters. I work with him and he said you're a member of Midbury Drama Club. Yes, I am. Well, I've just moved to the area and I'm keen to join a drama club. Great. Yes, I can give you some information. We're one of the oldest drama clubs in the area, as the club started in 1957. We now have about 60 members. Our youngest member is 10, and our oldest member is 78. Oh, I think I saw a picture in the newspaper the other day of some of your members being presented with a prize. Yes, the youth section did very well in a competition and won £100, which will help with their next production. Uh, anyway, uh, tell me a bit more about yourself. Well, I've done a bit of acting. I was in a couple of musicals when I was at university and a historical play more recently. Hmm. We mainly do comedy plays. We get good audiences for that kind of thing. We haven't attempted a musical yet, but we might do one soon. Oh. Uh, when do you usually meet? On Tuesdays. Well, presumably I'll need to do an audition. Yes, there were a few auditions last Tuesday, and we'll be doing more at our next meeting, which is in two weeks' time. That's on Tuesday the 12th of March. There'll be another opportunity two weeks after that, which will be on the 26th of March. Oh, well, I can come to your next meeting, and if I don't get an acting part in a play, I'd be happy to help with something else. I've designed publicity before. Great. We're very short of people who can do that. So that would be really good. There are a lot of people who like making scenery, so we get plenty of help with that. But we haven't got enough people to do the lights at the moment. So if you think you can do that, or you have any friends who would like to, uh, do bring them along. We can show you what to do if you haven't got any experience. Mm, I'll have to think about it. So, do you meet in the theatre? We do our performances in the Manor Theatre, but we only hire that for the nights of the actual performances. We meet to rehearse every Tuesday evening in the Community Hall. We rent a room there. Oh, I'm not sure where that is. I'll be coming by car because I don't live in the town centre. It's in Ashburton Road. As you're coming towards the centre, down Regent Street, you need to turn left at the crossroads. Oh, I know. There's a big car park down there, just before you get to a hotel. It's on the other side of the road from the sports centre. That's it. That's the closest place to leave your car, and you don't have to pay in the evening to park there. We meet at 7.30, and we usually finish by 9.30 or 10. OK. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10.
Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. I haven't mentioned that we have to make a charge. Everyone pays a subscription of £180 to be a member for a year. You can pay for the whole year at once, or you can pay £15 every month. It works out the same. There are reductions for retired people and under-18s, but I don't think you come into either category. No, I'm 26. Oh, <laughs> that fee covers all the costs, like photocopying of scripts and producing the posters, but it excludes the costumes for the performances. We ask people to pay for the hire of those themselves. It does mean they look after them properly, as they know they won't get their deposit back otherwise. Mm. Can I come along to the next meeting, then? Of course. We'd love to see you. And if you want to know more about how we run the auditions or the next play we're doing, why don't you give our secretary a ring? She'll be really pleased to help you. Oh, what's her name? It's Sarah Sordicott. That's S A. W D I C O double T. Ah, got that. And her phone number? I've only got a mobile number for her. Um, just a minute. Uh, let me find it. Ah, yeah, it's um, O seven nine double five two four double O six three. Great. Thanks for your help. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. You will hear a radio programme in which a presenter called Jasmine tells her colleague Fergus about a charity. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. And now here's Jasmine, who's come to tell us about this week's charity. Hi, Fergus. This week, I'm going to talk about forward thinking and their plans for the Colville Centre. Mm -hmm. So, in recent years, people have realised how useful the arts can be within healthcare. The idea behind forward thinking is to use the arts to promote well-being. The charity develops projects for people with special needs and health problems and also delivers training to healthcare professionals in using the arts, as well as supplying them with information and advice. Forward thinking doesn't just run art and craft classes to distract people who are ill or recovering from illness but arranges longer-term projects and courses, as it's been shown that the arts can bring all sorts of positive changes in patients, including benefits such as shortening the length of stay in hospital and reducing the amounts of medicine they need. I see. Forward Thinking has experience of working with a broad range of people from young adults with learning difficulties to older people in homes or daycare centres and people with physical disabilities. The organisation's been around since 1986 and it gradually expanded during the 1990s. Then, in the new millennium, it was decided to find a memorable name. So it's been operating as Forward Thinking for several years uh, in fact, since 2005. It's quite a locally based charity, mainly for people in the southern part of this region, which includes all rural and urban communities outside the city of Clifton, which has its own organisation. 
There are, of course, some similar charities in other parts of the country, in London and so on. Hmm. And what's the present fundraising in aid of? Yeah. Well, the charity needs funding in order to buy the Colville Centre. This is a former village school, which was built in 1868. It was modernised and refurbished by the present owners last year, so it's ideal for art classes and for small social events, performances, seminars and so on. Forward Thinking is fundraising to purchase the building so they can use it to continue running classes and so on for the general public and eventually also for some of the people they help. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Right. So, can you give us a few ideas about what classes people might do there? Is it all art classes? Um, well, there are some very good art classes, but there are lots of other things going on as well. So, for example, there's ah, Learn Salsa with Nina Bellina's team. They say that salsa is an easy dance to learn. It's also an excellent form of exercise, according to Nina. And that class is for both men and women, of course. Uh huh. It's ideal for beginners and what they call refreshers. That's £100 for 10 sessions. Then, another class is called Smooth Movers. It's with Kevin Bennett. And it's for you if you don't have the same energy levels as you used to when you were a teenager. Uh -huh. <laughs> It's a gentle exercise class, geared to the needs of whoever is in the group in a particular session. And Kevin is qualified to teach classes to people getting over injuries and so on, and balance training. That's £60 for 10 sessions. Then there's a day called Art of the Forest with Jamie Graham, where you discover Upper Wood, a short walk from the Colville Centre, and learn how to design in 3D with natural materials. It's an unusual and exciting way to be creative. Jamie is an artist, with a background also as a country park ranger. Oh! For this day, youngsters must be accompanied by a parent or guardian, and the costs are adults, £40, under-14s, £10 but it's best value at £80 for a family of four. The next one is The Money Maze, and this is a series of talks by Peter O'Reilly, an independent financial advisor. He gives advice on family finances, things like everything parents need to know about managing the costs of bringing up children, sending them to university, and actually also about care for elderly relatives. It's £10 per talk which will all go to support forward thinking. And as a final example of what's on offer, there's Make a Play. That's for 8 to 14s. And this activity is such a hit that it usually sells out within days of being announced. Basically, what you do is write, rehearse and perform a play in just two days. And it doesn't require any previous experience. I gather there's lots of fun and silliness along the way. And the best bit, perhaps, is that there's a performance for family and friends at the end. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's just £50 for two days. Pretty good range of activities, I think. And all raising money for a good cause. Yes. And the all-important contact details are colville at forwardthinking.org.uk or write... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now it turns to part three. You will hear a tutor and two students discussing the best ways to study. Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Well, how are you both settling in? Fine. Yes, no problems. So far, anyway. Good. Remember that as your personal tutor, I'm here to help you if you do have any difficulties. Now, as you know, lectures start on Monday, so I thought we'd look at a few ways of making the most of them, especially in terms of the notes you take. Let's begin by thinking about what you can do before you even go to the lecture. Any ideas? Um, make sure you're up to date with all the background reading, so you know plenty about the subject already. Yes, that's essential. The lecturer will assume you have that knowledge. Anything else, Carlos? Well, uh, check what the topic's going to be. Of the lecture, that is. I'd go a bit further than that and consider what the content may be. Then you could ask yourself some questions that you want answering and listen out for the relevant information during the lecture. Okay. Now that brings us to the lecture itself and the actual business of writing notes. But there is a lot to deal with there, so we'll come back to that later. What I'd like to do for the moment is continue with the process of note-taking and move on to the next stage. Any suggestions for what that might be? When the lecture is over, you mean? Yes, once you're able to sit down somewhere quiet with your notes. Uh, read them? More than that, you need to make sure they'll still make sense to you weeks, months later. Edit them? Yes, that's what's needed. Mm. It's well worth spending a few minutes on it. Any missing words, anything difficult to read, things you didn't have time to jot down, now is the time to do so, while everything's still fresh in your mind. Right. And after that, when's the best time to revise them? When do you think, Carlos? Um, I'd say just before the next lecture, in the same subject. Precisely. <laughs> That's a vital time to look at them again, for obvious reasons. But it's definitely not the only time. When should you revise them again? A month later, maybe? Uh, sooner, and much more often than that. I'd recommend you look at them again once a week. That's why it's so important they're complete and easy to follow. Before the talk continues, look at questions Now answer questions 26 to 29. Right. Let's go back to note-taking and begin with the basics before the lecture has even started. What should you do when you walk into the room? Get a good seat, at the front if you can, uh, where you can hear clearly and avoid distractions. Yes, though obviously others will have had the same idea, so it's as well to get there a bit early. So, when the lecture's underway and you're busy jotting things down, what should you try to ensure? That you're getting all the main points. And what if you don't catch something, something you know must be important? Um, uh, I'd leave a space. Then I could check it later, perhaps by asking a question at the end and fill it in afterwards. That's an excellent way to deal with it, yes. <laughs> and there's something else I'd like to mention here. Talking about going through notes afterwards, it's absolutely vital that what you write is legible for one very good reason. It saves time. You'll waste many hours during the course if your revision is held up because you can't read what you've written. 
Okay, what else can we do to make listening and note-taking more efficient? Well, I always listen out for signpost words. Uh, uh sorry, what are they? <laughs> they're the ones lecturers use to say where they're going. A bit like a signpost at a road junction, I suppose. Things like, the first reason is, however, to sum up, and so on. Yes, they can tell you when something important is coming, and help you organise your notes, too. Now answer question 30. Is there anything else you can add, Carlos? Uh, there's something I think's very useful, but it's later, after the lecture is finished. Yeah, that's fine. Go on. Well, what I do is go through what I've written down, summing up the main points in a few words in the margin, on the left-hand side of the page. I try to use words that'll jog my memory, so that I can remember what everything's about when I look at them again. Yes, that can work very well. What some people do to review their notes is cover up their full notes from the lecture, maybe with a piece of paper or a card, and concentrate just on what they've put in the margin, trying to recall the details. Then they move the cover down a little and check whether they were right. Or you could put your main points on another piece of paper and clip them together. Instead of covering and uncovering, you just hold a page in each hand. Sure. It's down to personal preference, really. Everyone has their own learning style. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. You will hear a professor give a lecture on Louisa May Alcott. First, you have some time to look at the questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and complete the timeline in questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon. Today I'd like to continue our discussion of the lives of prominent American writers by talking about Louisa May Alcott, one of the best-known 19th century writers. Alcott is known for her moralistic girls' novels, but she was a much more serious individual than those novels might lead one to believe. She was born in 1832, the daughter of Bronson Alcott, who was one of the founders of the Transcendentalist movement. Bronson Alcott was a philosopher, but not a provider, and the family lived close to poverty. From an early age, Louisa was determined to find a way to improve her family's economic situation. As a teenager, she worked to support her family by taking on a variety of low-paying jobs, including teacher, seamstress and household servant. Alcott also started writing when she was young. She wrote her first novel when she was just 17 years old, although it wasn't published until many years after her death. It was called The Inheritance. In 1861, the Civil War broke out. Alcott worked as a volunteer, sewing uniforms and bandages for soldiers. The following year, she enlisted as an army nurse, she spent the war years in Washington, nursing wounded soldiers at a military hospital. While working at the hospital, she wrote many letters to her family at home in Massachusetts. After the war, she turned the letters into a book, which was published under the title Hospital Sketches. She also wrote numerous romantic stories, which she sold to magazines. Around this same time, she was offered the opportunity to travel to Europe as the companion to an invalid. When she returned home from Europe in 1866, she found her family still in financial difficulty and in need of money, so she went back to writing. 
Her big break came in 1868 with the publication of her first novel for girls, Little Women. The novel achieved instant success, and the public wanted more. From then on, Alcott supported herself and her family by writing novels for girls. It wasn't the writing she had dreamed of doing, but it earned her a good income. Alcott took care of her family for the rest of her life. In 1878, her youngest sister May got married. A year later, May died after giving birth to a daughter. Louisa Alcott raised her sister's orphaned child. In 1882, Bronson Alcott suffered a stroke. Soon after that, Louisa Alcott set up a house for him, her niece, her sister Anna, and Anna's two sons in Boston. Her mother was no longer living by this time. Alcott was still writing novels for girls, including two sequels to Little Women, Little Men and Joe's Boys. The latter was published in 1886. Louisa Alcott had suffered poor health ever since she contracted typhoid fever while working as a war nurse. She died in March of 1888, at the age of 55. She was buried in Concord, Massachusetts. That is the end of Part 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. So guys, don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page. I'll update some recent exams for more updates related to recent IELTS exam writing as topics, listening, reading, practice test and speaking you got guesswork. Please guys participate in everyday new IELTS listening and reading practice tests to achieve your desired band score in your actual IELTS exam. For more IELTS material visit my official website www.ielsupdatesandrecentexams.com The link is given below in the description. If you need PDF files of latest IELTS material then please join my telegram channel. So guys please write your score below the comment section. Again thanks for listening. God bless you all guys. Stay tuned. Stay safe.